Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, I... Uh, It, it seems like just, you know, we have a few days in between each of our services and um, the, the Bible is so large, you know, and there's so many things and I, like, if, if we really do walk in fellowship with him, it, he's constantly... You know, God talks all the time. The question is, is do we hear him all the time, you know? And uh, we're, we're, we're like waiting for that Big Bang Theory to happen. You know, I, I said this the other night at the house, is that God wants to talk to us face to face. That still small voice, that voice where he doesn't have to yell or anything. But he, like thunder, right? But he wants that sound to have the impact of thunder, that it gets your attention to the point where it changes your life. You know, it's like, like, hey, go do this or whatever. And it's quiet, but the sound of it is so impactful in our lives. It literally becomes, you know, light is understanding, right? that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. And it just is a release of who he is, his light and his life, out of us that will produce the glory that God has determined. And so, like, I, like, you know, I, I, love, I love God's word for sure, um, the written word. Uh, the one thing that I've always liked about it is it's real it's living it's alive and the cool thing about it is it's past present and future yet it's now it's always present truth because it's spirit and if I limit it to any age in the past only to now or just the future, I will miss everything that God is doing and always done. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much our minds and our understanding has changed through the ages. You know, uh, I really can't wait to the day that everybody can really understand this, that Jesus was not plan B. Christ wasn't plan B. You know, I think I really, like my dad always used to say it, like, like even if Adam didn't fall, Christ was always coming, you know, and I, I understood that, you know, to a certain dimension. But, you know, after working at General Motors several years and working in engineering, I came to the realization that God was the greatest engineer you could ever have. But what has evolved out of that all along the path is, God was not surprised Adam was going to fall because in the plan, he already made the provision for the fall. But the reason was, was because he understood there had to be a test. Like no teacher is going to, you know, just teach kids stuff or whatever without a test for approval, you know. Anybody can say that they are a master gardener, right? But the reality is, just because you call yourself a Christian because of what both Isaiah and Jesus said, was like they literally said, this is what Jesus picked up. He says, like everything you know, everything you say is learned behavior. It's academic, And we, you know, like, you, you can get lost with this whole debate, should you or shouldn't. Like, oh, God's love passes all understanding or all knowledge, right? Yeah, but that kind of love is it's a laid-down life love. No greater love, right? 
So that will pass because now what you know, you experience. You express. You literally live. It's no more cheap talk or talk that doesn't cost anything. But God, being a great engineer, had the second test come for the last of Adam, that his word would never return void. That when he created man, mankind, in his image and his likeness, that he had to instill everything that was in the design be forever, began, whatever that means. Knowing when the product had the right ingredients, it couldn't fail. Like, I understand this. Please, this is, we've become great wordologists. But the worst thing about being a wordologist we allow the spirit of deception to work. We learn how to say the right words with a different intent behind it, just so we don't have to deal with things. Right? But listen, God knew that Adam would fall. God knew that Jesus would not. Adam was falling regardless. Even though he was made in the image after the likeness and was like God, it wasn't the fullness of God. Because it takes Christ to fill us up. Oh, if Eve would have just told the serpent, like, if he would have just told him, I already am like God, she wouldn't have fallen. Not true. I think the reality is, is we, because we read it in like three seconds, we have no idea how many times. Like if we go to Samson, or if we go to David, day by day, until it wears you down. It's laying hold of him in the wear down. Everybody say this. He's sanding me smooth. Just hope it's not our lips and chin. Yeah. Because God is after a product that is full of him and nothing else. He won't settle for less. So, you know, like, and I love Isaiah, and I love Jeremiah. I love the Old Testament. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, that's the Old Testament. But if they understood that it's still alive, right, then they would realize what God is really doing. Everybody say this with me. The Old Testament was part of the design. Those folks had no choice when they were born, just like you and I. You and I are fortunate we were born on this side of the cross. But God predetermined that. They're not less, we're not better. We just think we are. We're way more fortunate. They were born, like, literally up until like 150 years ago in antiquated times. Like, who wanted to fly the first airplane? It's not like going on the first cell phone. But by the grace of God, we've gotten it pretty good that most airplanes know what to do now. Stay in the air until it's time to come down. Of course, there are still some misfortunate things, but not that often anymore. Everybody say, because God is perfecting things. 
And if he does it in the material world, how much more in the spiritual world? Amen? But I, I love, I love, you know, I love that God pictures, you know, the development. Like, everybody, like, what's taking God so long? And Peter wrote 2,000 years ago, only people count God being slow. You know, I think I'll bake a cake. I'd like it done in two minutes. How's it going to turn out? Anyway, when Jeremiah and Isaiah prophesied, they literally prophesied three things. The children of Israel were about to go into captivity because of their shortcomings. They weren't poor. They weren't. They had all kinds of materialism because God had built the wealth of the nations. I think I say it all the time, but I think it's still one of the saddest indictments about King Ahab. He was the one king credited with lots of inventions to make Israel, the ten tribes, as rich as Judah. Judah was fortunate because they just had God's blessing on them in a way that, you know, Solomon was the king and he made them a very rich society, but when they divided, guess who kept the wealth? Wasn't the poor people, was it? But he increased the wealth in material. Right? But he was the most wicked king Israel ever had. Everybody say that pictures the condition of the heart. He can give you a good job. He can be good all the time, which he is. The only reason we ever think he's not good all the time is because of the bad that's happening in our lives. But it doesn't change his condition. You want to know how good he is? You can have an attitude towards him, and he doesn't hold it against you. If that was your kid, you'd kick their behind. But he works a different way. But Israel was going into captivity for falling short of God's standard that he had already laid out for him. The pattern was there, right? Everybody say the blueprint was made. Well, they didn't have the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. They did. How do you know that? David said the spirit or the anointing was upon him. The Christ was already living in his life. Well, he still had problems, just like Samson. The anointing could break every bit of the Philistines' power, but he couldn't break his own habits. Now, we all know what his habits were, and we like to throw stones at him, but what if your habit was just a bad attitude when you decided to have one? And you keep having them, and you keep having them, but you can't break them. So they ended up going into exile. But this is what Isaiah and Jeremiah both prophesied. He said, you're going into captivity, right? Everybody say that was historically fulfilled. But it pointed to something better. It was a pattern or a picture for something better. Everybody say the Messiah. Jesus was showing up. Might have taken a few hundred years to happen, and everybody went to their graves thinking that Isaiah and Jeremiah were false prophets. They thought they were such false prophets, they killed both of them. One they cut in half, the other they stoned, so tradition says. Doesn't really matter whether they did or they didn't. They all died together. And Jesus showed up. Everybody say, he showed up. Now watch this. And Christ never left the planet. Oh, wait a minute. Time out. No, no, he never left the planet. 
He poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost upon all flesh. And most Christians will say that he lives inside of them. And yet they look for him somewhere else. Because of traditions and doctrines of man, mankind. But he said, the mystery hid from the ages is living right inside of you. It's such a secret that very few people know it. And the only way to know it is to really know him, not about him. It's to know him. Pick your favorite athlete, movie star, whatever. And you can tell me you know a lot about them, but the chances are pretty good you never actually met them. You know the stats. You've read all about them. But have you ever encountered him or experienced him? You know what down at his feet really means? You're walking out his life. You know what seeking his face really means? You're expressing his image. And now, because the Messiah has showed up, the third dimension of what they prophesied is a people who appropriate his finished work. They don't just say they're master gardeners or it's finished. They lay hold of it. It's not a message by itself. Oh, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. They live the life of who he is. And one of the things that I love, because we started this in, in Jeremiah, is that in chapter 33, like, I love it, I love it, I love it. He said in verse 6, he said, I will bring health and cure. Everybody say, Jesus showed up, and he never left. Well, what about where's his physical body? Look, it's in a dimension that you and I just can't, like, we still have a veil. We see things darkly, or like in a, He doesn't wonder what the price of gas is. Because he says good, it's good all the time. He can eat and not ever worry about whether he'll ever eat again. Well, that's Jesus and not us. Look, he created us in his image after his likeness that he would form us to establish his life where? In the earth. The simplest prayer that Jesus gave all of humanity was pray thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is already in the realm of the heavens, the spirit. But it comes from a position of understanding who the Father is. That's where it begins. It's not how you start the race. It's how you end the race. Now, starting does matter. Because if you jump the gun, you can be DQ'd, right? And he gives you a second chance. Now, I don't know about racing that much, right? How many times can you, can you uh, jump the gun? Twice? Like in, a, you know, like in a sprint race, like when they come out of the blocks, like they can go back and do it again, right? One time. You do it a second time, guess what? You get disqualified. Doesn't matter how good you are. You can be the fastest runner in the world. So anyway... The thing that I love about Jeremiah, what we've been talking about in chapter 3, he said, I will bring health and cure. Everybody say this with me. This is, this whole chapter is, the 
unbreakable promise of God can be broken. Cannot. If you can break the covenant of day and night, you can break this. How many can stop day and night? Nobody. I'm glad you understood that. Nobody can do that. And so we've talked about this, right? He told them to call on him. Called, told us to call him and he will answer. We call in what? Praise and worship. A, a true praise and worship lifestyle. And then he brings about the prophetic utterance wherein I love this, where the testimony or the evidence of Jesus in your life is the spirit of the prophetic or living word. It comes alive. Why? We already did this. I don't want time again. Whatever God says, it will happen. God cannot lie. No, he's not a liar. No, no, no. He cannot lie. Because whatever he says is truth. Do you know what I love about God? Like, this is a killer for us. Because we like to be jokesters and all that. But listen, like Ephesians says, like, um, God does not have foolish jesting come out of his mouth. Because whatever he says is true. So he only moves from a position to produce his promise. And no other position. And yet, we like to do that because it gives us a laugh. But because he is joy, he doesn't need it. Because everything in his world is perfect. <laughs> everything. Everybody say this with me. He gave it to us. No, no, he gave it to us. Do you know why we struggle over thoughts like this? It's just natural. It's humanism. Trained. Learned. Behavior. First carnal question would be, we can't have fun? What more fun could you ever have living in the joy of the Lord, which is your strength? <laughs> Help us, Jesus. So anyway, the other night, Wednesday, we talked about Jerusalem, right? We went. Let's, let's read verse 9. And it, it was Jerusalem, um, shall be to me a name of Joy. If I went to uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, around verse 10, right? The very first thing, well, it's a famous verse with the word joy in it. What is it? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Is that not true? Romans 14. What is the kingdom of God? First he says this. The kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. It's not natural realm. But it's what? Righteousness, peace, Joy, where? In the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. In Psalm 16, 11, it says the presence of God is the what? Fullness of joy. No, <laughs> like I, I'm laughing because you know it's like look no the fullness of God's presence is the fullness of His kingdom is His presence. It's not meat or drink. It's nothing in the material realm. It doesn't matter where you're standing. If God's presence is full, it brings fullness of joy. You'll never be unhappy. When Adam fell, was God disappointed or unhappy? He couldn't be. Because his perfect plan was working. I should stop, right? Until we really all understand that. No, no. Look. Like we would say this. Who in their right mind would ever make a plan like this? 
But would you want to buy a car that someone didn't know how to design right or never tested it? And you had to pay a lot of money for it? You wouldn't want it. Would you? If I gave you a brand new gun and no one ever tested it, it could blow up in your face, couldn't it? If I gave the world a humanity that was never tested to express my image, what would it look like? When the prophets have declared, and the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth. We've come to an hour where God is after fullness. Willy Wonka was living in a room that everything was cut in half until Charlie showed up. Charlie, my boy, and brought him the goods that he had given him to make us whole. I know, it's a, not everybody's going to understand why I said that, but if you ever watch Willy Wonka, you, and I'm talking about the... Uh, I'm talking about the one from the 70s movie. Like, the reality is this. It's like, we've only seen the half of it. The Queen of Sheba showed up and she said, well, boy, it was bigger than what I ever thought. She pictures the church. Oh, my God. What he has prepared, my eye and ear never could comprehend. We've only heard or seen the half of it. But don't you think the half should push us across the finish line? Make you so hungry that there's not another thing that could satisfy you? He loved Ruth because she came to him not for corn, her own life, sustenance, because she loved him. And he ended up giving her seven measures total. She already had one, and he finished what he started in her life. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, thank you, God. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just rambling. Not really, but God is trying to get you and I to fall in love with him. I always say this, right? A relationship with God is like a marriage. It'll never be Never be like bliss every single day because the responsibility of day-to-day living carries that responsibility of keeping things upright. Amen. All right, I want to, I want to, uh, okay, so I want to continue here with this verse. I don't know. I think it's pretty cool that we sang a song that said God is good all the time because I got a little excited this morning and, and um, like I had been reading this for the last couple of weeks or whatever it's been, but this morning, um, at least for me, I could see what God is doing in our lives. And he is releasing himself in a way that we've never seen him before. It's more than just believing. It's more than just walking by faith, which you still need. But he literally is changing the environment 
for his purpose because it's an unbreakable promise that he has declared. He's moving forward in spite of us. He's moving forward because of his word. It's real, it's alive, and it's unchangeable. It cannot be stopped. As individuals, we can be stopped. We can stop it ourselves, in our lives. But as the promise and the purpose of God, it cannot be stopped. Everybody say, that's good news. And what he has determined for you and I to appropriate that Jesus became the praise and the honor in all the earth and in all the creation and that his desire is that you and I would appropriate that life. That a church, Jerusalem, isn't that what we talked about? Jerusalem, a habitation of peace would express all of his joy. A name, a nature. You don't have to work it up. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do it because it's the right thing. It just flows out of your life automatically. And it can't be anything else. Not a faucet where you turn it on and turn it off. It's there. It's not a, I lost it for a moment and I need forgiveness. Everybody say, that's good. But there's something better. If I only lived in the realm of God's forgiveness, that would let me know that I still have issues. That God has something greater. It's better than turning the other cheek. That God never retaliates. Period. No matter what anybody does to them. This is why Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier and Jesus restores the ear of the soldier. Remember what I told you? Could you imagine if the scenario was his head? Because I'm sure that's what Peter wanted to do. Maybe the soldier did one of these. Oh, just got my ear. But no matter what the incident was, Jesus restored it. Because he moved from a heart that was full of of joy. And that life, that life is what Jeremiah was prophesying in the restoration of an unbreakable promise that the captivities of sin and death, not just Babylon, not just confusion, not just historically, would return to God in a full dimension without being empty, but being full. The presence of the Lord brings the what? The fullness of joy. It becomes the habitation of peace in all the earth. Sorry. Jeremiah 33. It may seem like I'm rambling, but I am not. <laughs> And it's not because of what I'm saying uh, or because it's me. Because like, like, ah, like, you know one of the biggest problems we all have in Christianity? We t try to filter God's word within our own limitations of thinking. When he said it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by spirit. I told you this the other night, right? We want to water down the lamb, by boiling it in its mother's milk. Making it palatable to our lives. When the 
prescribed pattern is eat the lamb that's been roasted with fire. The Holy Ghost and fire. Everybody say this with me. The only way to become refined, purified, is through the fire. Everybody say this. I don't like the fire, but I love Jesus. Like a transformer, he knows how to increase the voltage and decrease it so that you and I don't blow up. One of Brother Byron's messages, I, I don't know why, it's just coming to me. We can get warm by the fire. Everybody say, Jesus is the fire, the light. We can be on fire. Or we can become fire. Amen. Okay, verse 9. And it, shall come to, and it shall be to me a name of joy. I don't have time to go through there. Revelation 14. Everyone that was found with the Father's name where? On their forehead or in their minds. Everybody say, mind of Christ. Mind of Christ. And a praise and an honor before all nations of the earth. Okay? A praise, right? I don't have time this morning. I don't want to take the time. You already know this stuff anyway. Like, I really don't do you any good. What you guys need is something beyond me. It's called Jesus. You just need to meet Jesus. Wait. I do too. We've met him only to a certain level. You don't need more teachings or doctrines. You need a person. This is why I live by the premise. If I've done my job, you don't need me anymore. Can you imagine if I came over to your house, Tiffany, and told you guys how to live? You'd be like, can you tell your dad to get out of here? You think I'm kidding. No matter how much she loves me. You don't need me. No, you need him. To rearrange everything in your life so that you can become the praise and the honor to the whole creation. He said, listen, look at, listen to, oh my God, I don't have, see now I'm going to do it because I didn't have time. Genesis 12, you know this stuff, I don't have time, but I'm going to do it. 12, verse 1. I'm reading fast, so you better stay with me quick. And the Lord spake... Oh, sorry, I hit Exodus. <laughs> better slow down, right? Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get out of your country. Get away from your family. Get away from your father's house. And I'm going to bring you to a land that I'm going to show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless thee. Make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. I love that. He didn't say you're going to get a blessing. He said, I will make you a blessing. Everybody say this with me. Abraham is my father. How do you know that? This is what Paul wrote. Father Abraham. Isn't God generational? But the cool thing, the lineage goes through David. The cool thing, this is why it's only Abraham, David, Christ. The seed of of Christ. The lineage, everybody say it, is spiritual. And I will bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse thee. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Every family in the earth. Okay, everybody's looking over there, so I'll wait. All the families in the earth will be blessed. Every family in the earth will be blessed because of this seed. What are we talking about? That all the nations will understand and know the glory of his name. The honor and the praise of his name. Not because they preach a message. I can't even get your guys' attention. It's not about a message. It's about a person. He makes our life alive. 
And the unbreakable promise isn't in the future. It's happening right now. We just haven't come to the fullness of it. Watch. Do you love that boy? I bet you love that boy with all your heart, don't you? Everybody say this with me. That's the promise that can't be broken. In thy seed. Why do you think there's been such an attack for the last umpteen years to destroy the family, even by the church folks? Church folks get his divorce just as much as anybody else because it's spirits that deceive when all God ever wanted was a house or a family, not a building, not something made with hands, a heart, a mind to glorify Him in everything they say and do. An unbreakable promise that he will fulfill and never change. All right, hang on. I want uh, uh, Psalms 2, I don't have to go there, that he, he, told, he goes through the whole thing about the, the, uh, the heathen rage and all that, but this is what he said. He says, I'll give the nations to you for an inheritance. Okay? That's what he said. All right. Um, okay. Uh, honor and praise all the nations. Five, five. Who gets to inherit the earth? The meek. Why do I want to inherit the earth if I'm going to heaven to see Jesus? Oh, wait. Something's not right. Traditions and doctrines of people. But the word says the meek inherit the earth. The humble. The ones who come to God and surrender their life. All right. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and, and chapter 5, verse 10, we get to know all about it is because why? He says that he has made us kings and priests. Those aren't positions. The Old Testament called it a kingdom of priests. In other words, watch. What does a priest do? He expresses mercy and peace. The kindness of God. All right? Uh, I love it. I love it. I'm sorry. And now here. And they shall hear. Everybody say, they shall hear. Look, do you remember this? Remember the woman at the well? This is what she said when she went back. After having a conversation with Jesus, she went back to her own town, and she, this is what she said, come see what I heard. I want you to see what I heard. I believe with all of my heart, that, like seriously, we're like the radio when there was no television. We have a full opportunity to proclaim and declare all the goodness of God until God can put a real picture on it. Don't you like that TVs have gotten better through time? Everybody say this when God is perfecting his vision. Not that he can't see, it's what others will be able to see. He got the material well right. He's working on our lives. It's so good to me. I, I love this. Look at, and they shall hear, watch this. All the good that I, God, right, do unto them. Yeah. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness. Why? Because God's good all the time. For all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it or unto them. Now, walk with me just for a minute. I'm going to stop at some point. 
Now, this could break open into a really wild moment. No, it could. This is how, God, this is how good God is to us. That his unbreakable promise is already in action. It's working right now. If you don't think that is true, then ask yourself, why is he blessing me? I don't feel too blessed. Really? Really? What in the world is inside of us that's trying to get out? The blessing. It's in the seed. It's in the life. It's in Him. Watch. Look. The good, right? The good, the good, the good. Turn with me to Genesis 50. I wish I had time to really go through all this, but I don't. Now, you know the story. Joseph, this is at the end, right? This is, this is what he... And, um, and the brothers were afraid, right? Now that, now that Israel had passed, their father Jacob had died, they were all afraid that... Um, Joseph being the king, or in charge anyway, that he was going to take them all out, right? Everybody say this. This is what people think. They still think this. Jesus didn't come to destroy us. Jesus came to bring us life, and life much more abundantly. He just wants us to line up with him. He's not out to get us in the context of get rid of us. He's out to get us in the context of making us like himself. I don't know about you, but that's good news. Have we heard it so much that we're just, you know, it's like we get used to it. I'll bet you, Corey, if we could afford it, and we hired the best chef in the world and everything else that would go with it, that after a while we would start wanting to eat maybe a hamburger from McDonald's. Because we just get used to the best. Okay, so you know what? They were afraid, right? So... Joseph says to them, you know, they went to him and said, will you forgive us, Joseph? And I love this. It says Joseph wept. Do you remember Saul wept? But it never stopped his pursuit of wanting to kill David. But Joseph wept, and look what he says in verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I, for am I in the place of God, or am I the one that's supposed to punish you for what you did? No. Listen. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. He meant it for good. Paul wrote this. He said, he works all things together for good. I can't comprehend all that. But let me tell you, he does. Like some of the worst things in my life, God's made it right. Really? I know what it's like to lose a wife and a mother for their children. But I tell you what, the experience has made me what God is after. Are you out of your mind? Yes. I hope so. Because he works all things together for good. If you don't believe it, stop singing the song, Danielle. Stop singing it that says he's good all the time. Because then we'd be lying. He's good all the time. He's never given up the ghost again. He did it once. Christ dieth no more. Whatever he has in store that my mind can't comprehend, it's better. 
is better. I'm starting to get loud because I'm getting excited that God has prepared a people to release the fullness of his honor, his praise, and joy in the earth. No one's going to like this. I just started thinking about this recently. It's a little change of mind. What if death was a tool in God's toolbox to get us to where he wants us? We only love Jesus when he makes everything right for us, never understanding that we're determining what is right and wrong. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. Why? To bring to pass, I'm going to put this in there, his unbreakable promise. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive, so that I could save the lives of many people. Would have you hung your son on a cross who never did a thing wrong? Everybody say this with me. I love it when he makes me think. Now, did you tell the truth? (laughs) Or did you just repeat me like a parrot? No, seriously. You know what real glory is? This is why I love my dad when he always would say this. Like people are looking for glory. I'm going to glory. No, the Bible literally says this in the New Testament. It's the Greek word doxeo, which means the thinking mind of God. What is God's thoughts? What's his mind say on every matter in the earth? I love it. And this is what he said, that I do unto them and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness. You know to make the earth fear and tremble God? is when God's people literally express the fullness of his goodness. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22. You know these verses by heart, but I want to pick one thing out. But the fruit of the Spirit, right? What is the fruit of the Spirit? It just is the nature of God producing life. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Goodness. You know what I love about this word, goodness? Goodness. It literally is the word that it means virtue or benefits. Benefits. That's what it is. Everybody say, serving God has its benefits. And it's not always materialism. The truth of the matter is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you need will be added to you. Don't seek those things that everybody else in the world is after. I think I'll go build houses and cars and all those kind of things to make my life my barns full. Never was what God was after. This is why God picks them according to the Bible. Not many wise, not many noble, not many rich. We think we have money. No, we really think we have money. Hey, I make $150,000 a year. That's nothing. It could be gone in a minute. That's not the wealth of God. You know why you only make $100,000 a year? It just makes it sustainable to the next year. You have to keep repeating the cycle. Is that a bad thing? 
You're missing my point when I'm trying to get you to understand that God is the honeycomb. He's the source. The source is endless life. Jesus doesn't worry about the price of anything. And if you and I fall into that category, watch this. Whatever you need in this life, he said, I'll provide it. How do you know that? Because the unbreakable promise is functioning right now. Seriously, have you ever run out of money? There are days that look like you might. Well, I can't buy everything I want. Well, that's a different spirit. We'll make fun in the church of people that drink and drunks, and yet we get fat on the lust of buying everything we can on the Internet. Isn't it interesting how Adam made it easier to expose gluttonous spirits? When all God wanted you and I to do was be the praise and the honor, to show forth the joy and the glory of God, to make the nations tremble and fear. What kind of fear? Not to run them in the ground, that they would learn the fear of the Lord just like you and I. We honor you, God. We honor you, God. The goodness, the virtue, right? You know what I like about this word? It's only found four times in the New Testament. Everybody say this with me. It's a universal, worldwide goal of God to release this fruit to make the nations tremble in fear and they will see the prosperity Is not money or materialism. It's the land of the living. God. I told you the other night. Go read Ecclesiastes. You can be rich or poor, but the end result for every human being is the same. Death. And because mankind couldn't figure out or solve that riddle, they created doctrines that say, well, then I guess go to heaven. And you can't find it in the Bible anywhere. The truth of the matter, it says the spirit returns to God and the body goes back to the dirt. The same to everybody. Vanity. One 300-year-old city that everybody loves in the world to go to that they call paradise can be gone in a flash. I find it interesting that the last two cities that have the most death toll due to fire, one was literally called paradise, another pitcher's paradise. And yet Paul and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Everybody say another realm, another dimension, an expression of honor and joy. Goodness occurs four times to worldwide desire of God to fill the earth with his glory. Amen? All right. I've lost your attention, so let's stand. God help us. Help us, Jesus. The good thing about God, and I love this part for me, it keeps me sane. I don't have to depend on your lives to make what God's doing a measuring stick. It's just don't have to do it. All I can do is encourage you to seek him like you never did before. Become, this is what I told the boys this morning. I said, listen, you guys need to be in jail. Prisoners of the Lord. Surrender to God. Because this is what God is after in our life. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. God wants prosperity in our life. He wants us to be whole, sound, and safe from the peace, with peace from the war. Where's the war? It's between the ears.
God's after his goodness to cause fear to every imagination, denomination we have in our lives. So that the whole earth can see Jesus. Help me, Father. Oh, help me, Jesus. Bless you, God. Seal it. Help us that your name would be glorified forever and ever, Jesus. Amen and amen.